This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This lecture is on Chapter 20 of the free paper F9 lecture notes and is on something called the Capital Asset Pricing Model. And just to introduce uh, what's coming, and there are some numbers here, but they're um, pretty easy numbers. When we talked in an earlier chapter about the risk to shareholders, the risk was due, if you remember, to the fact that dividends aren't certain. Uh, the dividends they're going to get may be higher than they expect, they may be lower. But the more the dividends start to fluctuate, the more risky, we say, the investment is. Uh, now, one thing that created risk was the gearing, the fixed interest payable. And we talked about the theories of gearing in the last chapter. That was Medigliani and Miller, which uh, I said enough about and there were no calculations on. But even if there's no gearing at all, there's still risk due to the nature of the business. You know, and we're never certain what the profits are going to be in the future. The profits may be higher than expected, they may be lower than expected, and as a result, the dividends may be higher or lower. And what we're talking about in this chapter is that risk, the risk due to the nature of the business. Some businesses are inherently more risky. The profits might go up, might go down a lot. Other businesses, uh, the profits are, uh, are much more predictable. They don't vary as much. We say they're less risky. And so we're talking about what we call the business risk. For this chapter, forget gearing completely. Assume for this chapter that there's no gearing at all. So again, what we're concerned with is the fact that profits stand to fluctuate. The more they go up and down, the more risky the business is. And as I say, some businesses are a lot more risky than others. A firm of accountants, their profits are likely to be fairly stable because they do well. Um, if the, the economy is doing well, because they get more work. On the other hand, they do well if the economy is doing badly because companies are going bankrupt and they get more work that way. So their profits perhaps are fairly stable. They're not terribly risky. Other companies may be oil companies because they're so much affected by the price of oil their profits may go up and down a lot more and they are more risky. So that's what we're talking about, the risk of the actual type of business. And we say there are two elements to it, there are two things that make a business risky. One uh, part of it is what we call unsystematic risk. Uh, which I'll explain in a moment. The other part of it is systematic risk. And if I start with the second one first, systematic risk, or the other name for it is market risk. This is risk due to general economic factors. The sort of thing I'm talking about there are things like uh, the rate of inflation. Uh, exchange rates. What I'm getting at, you see, is it, as the rate of inflation goes up or goes down, all companies are going to be affected by changes in the rate of inflation. Uh, they're not affected to the same degree. You know, some companies are affected enormously by changes in the rate of inflation, some companies not so much. But all companies uh, are going to be affected by the rate of inflation. It's not under the control of the individual business. Uh, exchange rates. As exchange rates change, as 
you know, whatever currency we're in, if we're in the US and we work on dollars, the dollar exchange rate, as that changes, it will affect all businesses. Some businesses it won't affect very much because they don't do much dealing abroad. Whereas uh, other businesses that do a lot of importing and exporting, they'll be affected a lot by changes in exchange rates. But these are general economic factors. Uh, they affect all businesses. But uh, the, the degree of the effect, how big an effect they have, it depends on the type of business, the level of uh, systematic risk. depends on the type of business, or using a posh word, uh, the business sector. So, you know, oil companies, they may be affected an awful lot by exchange rates, all oil companies, whereas uh, firms of accountants, who perhaps don't do much importing, exporting, they're affected to a, a very small degree. But all businesses within a particular sector, oil, all oil companies will be affected in a similar way. On the other hand, all accountants will be affected in a similar way to each other. But the level of risk will be different in different sectors. So that's one reason a business is risky. Factors due to, sorry, economic factors, as I've said. The other reason, though, is unsystematic risk. Actually, I'll put it below, then I can write. Unsystematic risk or oh, the other name for this is company-specific risk. And this risk, the other thing that affects the profits, it, this is due to factors within the particular company. And the sort of thing uh, we're looking at here, uh, just two examples. Uh, suppose one particular company has just appointed a new managing director. Sure, it makes things a bit more risky because we don't know yet whether he's going to turn out to be very good and profits will go up or he'll turn out to be a disaster and profits will fall. New managing director. It's something that only affects this particular company. Uh, other companies in our sector aren't affected, but our company is. Or maybe we're a company that has poor labour relations. Our workers have been going on strike a lot. Uh, it makes our business that much more risky. Uh, maybe we'll sort out the strike problem and profits will start going up or maybe the strike problem will get worse and it'll go down. You know, think of airlines. All airlines are affected to a similar extent by general economic factors. They'll have the same level of systematic risk. All airlines are affected in the same way by changes in inflation, changes in the price of the fuel and so on. But each airline will have its own unsystematic risk. The, um, some airlines recently have had a lot of strikes. It makes them more risky than other airlines that haven't had a lot of strikes. You know, the pilots and things going on strike. So we say for any business, there are those two elements of risk. The two together is the total riskiness. Systematic risk, the same for all airlines. Unsystematic risk, 
each individual airline company has different levels of unsystematic. Well, that's just terminology, but the relevance of it is this. Unsystematic risk can be removed by investors by what we call creating a portfolio. of shares. Just suppose you're thinking of investing in airlines. Surely, if you're advising your mother, who's got money to invest, you wouldn't tell her to put all her money in just one company. Because that one company, we've got both these risks involved. Surely, you'd tell her to spread her money and invest in lots of a little bit in lots of different companies. So, okay, one company may have a, a new management director. Maybe they'll do well. Maybe they'll do badly. Another company, maybe they've had strikes. They may sort it. They may not. But to put all your money in just one uh, share is very risky. But spread it amongst lots of shares. We know, have 20 or 30 sh different shares. And okay, one might do badly because of unsystematic reasons, and another might do well. Overall, hopefully, it, what you might call cancels out. Now, of course, we can't all afford to invest money in lots of different shares. But we can effectively, because we've got things like what we call unit trusts or mutual funds, where you, you might only have a, a little money, a few hundred dollars, but put it in a mutual fund. And they put lots of people's money together and then they invest in lots of different shares. But if we create a portfolio, again, that risk, unsystematic risk can be removed, cancels out. However, systematic risk Remember, it's due to factors in the economy as a whole. If inflation rates change, all shares will be affected, all companies will be affected. Systematic risk cannot be removed. But do appreciate the level depends on the type of business. <laughs> now, I'm nearly there for the talk bit, and then I'll show you the arithmetic, which I think you will find very straightforward. But think again about my example in airlines. Put all your money in shares in one airline, and you're at risk for both reasons. Changes in the economy will make the profits go higher or lower. But in addition, Factors in that particular airline will make the profits higher and lower as well. You're suffering both risks. But instead of putting all your money in shares in one airline, if you spread your money and buy shares in 20 different airlines, the unsystematic risk, we say, will effectively cancel out of those 20 Oh, some will have good labour relations, some might have bad labour relations, but as one does well, another one perhaps does badly, that cancels out, that risk disappears. But even if you buy sh uh, shares in 20 airlines, the systematic risk will always be there. Wherever you invest, you're subject to risk due to changes in the economy. But one last time, Maybe investing in 20 airlines, changes in the economy will create more risk than investing in 20 shares in telephone companies or something. The unsystematic risk can be removed. 
systematic risk can't be. The level depends on the type of business. Well, the last bit before I do show the uh, arithmetic is that capital asset pricing model, we assume shareholders are what we call well diversified, that they have spread the money between lots of different shares. So if we assume that shareholders have created a portfolio, and are therefore what we call well diversified, defined, again think of your mother, she's got uh, $10,000 to invest, you don't tell her to put it all in one business, that's far too risky. You tell her to invest perhaps 500 in 20 different businesses. The unsystematic risk will uh, have disappeared. But of course, it doesn't matter how many shares you invest in, you are subject to the risk due to changes in the economy, the systematic risk. And so if we assume that shareholders are well diversified, they have spread the money into lots of shares, there'll be no unsystematic risk. Ooh, systematic risk, it's been diversified away. The only risk left is the systematic risk and therefore it is the systematic risk that determines the shareholders required rate of return. Uh, as always we say if there's more risk, shareholders want a higher return. If there's less risk, they'll accept a lower return. I think that's acceptable. But we say, because of everything that I've said previously, and I'm not going to repeat, we say it's the systematic risk that determines the required rate of return. It's, the only, it, it, it's only the systematic risk that shareholders are interested in on the assumption that they are well diversified, they've spread their investment over many shares. Now, sorry that uh, that was quite a lot of chat, but again, it is important, you, you know, the distinction between systematic and unsystematic, and that you appreciate what I'm saying as to why we're not concerned, in theory, about unsystematic risk. It's the level of systematic risk that determines the required rate of return. Well, capital asset pricing model it says, OK, we come up with a formula, which you'll see shortly. They say, if we can measure the systematic risk of an investment, then we can determine the rate of return that shareholders require. That's where the formula can come in. Um, I'll, to avoid going on too long, I'll stop this lecture here, but in the second lecture on this chapter, I'll show you how the systematic risk is measured and how we can use the systematic risk to determine the return that shells require.